Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to start one, part one of two on the second series of lectures from Foucault's uh, time at the Collège de France. This one titled Penal Theories and Institutions, which is from 1971, 1971-1972. And this one follows the ones I did a few weeks ago, lectures on the will to know. Now before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can see 300 or more episodes I already have up. You can like, share, subscribe, and then you'll see stuff that I release every single week, sometimes twice a week, but always on Saturdays. In any case, uh, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineau. There are links for all these things in the description or clickable things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure to do that. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find just the podcast alone on any podcast platform or click the link in the description. Or if you found this as a podcast, sometimes I accompany what I say with video on YouTube. So go and check that out if you want. Now, without further ado, let's jump into Penal Theories and Institutions, the second of like 13 lectures from Le Collège de France. The, the College of France. Le Collège de France. Okay, so this text, if any of you have ever opened up the book, you'll know that, interestingly, it's pretty much comprised of just, like, bullet points. It There is no recording of it, and so, therefore, there's no, like, single written prose uh, recounting the entire lecture. Instead, we just have Foucault's notes, which are quite detailed. So what I'm going to do here is try to provide a narrative to those notes, because if you just read them, you know, he jumps from idea to idea, they don't flow together, because they're meant really to be like prompts, and in the lecture he would he would elaborate on them. So I'm going to do my best here to give it, provide it to you as a narrative form, so that it flows and makes sense. And also I'm going to try to get rid of the, some of the repetition, because there is quite a bit of it. So here we're going to start with chapter one, which is just week one, and it goes, there's like 13 weeks. And this episode, I should say, is going to cover one, two, three, four, five. Weeks one, two, three, four, five. So he begins the lecture by saying that his focus will be on penal theories and institutions, but also on penal practice. Now, what we're going to see throughout this text is Foucault recounting or describing a transformation in the way in which power was conducted and justice was conducted in 16th and 17th century France. And at the end, he gives a little bit of a preview or he gives a snapshot of how that changed and what remained well into the 19th century. But here he's really focused on revolts that took place in 16th and century France against uh, efforts to impose taxes on the people largely on peasant populations. So he thinks here about the ways in which the state responded to these anti-tax revolts. What mechanisms, what measures did the state put in place in order to counter these efforts or counter these revolts? So some of the specific questions that he asks when considering penality or considering the penal system is who is repressing? Who is doing the repressing? Who is being repressed? How? Through, uh, through what instruments? And this is to move beyond the question of morality or uh, deviance and instead to consider the very mechanisms that are employed in order to handle and combat people who are considered to be immoral, considered to be evil, considered to be bad. And he identifies the extent to which that even these terms like being rendered evil or considered evil, considered bad, considered a delinquent, a criminal. These terms are new. And the ways in which people are clumped together in accordance with these broad characterizations really began to emerge and take shape in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, in France. So there was a lot happening in the 16th and 17th centuries in France. Industrialization was not fully <laughs> blown yet, but the roots of it were starting to spread. The idea of industrialization was starting to spread. There were transformations in the way that people were conducting labor. People were being hired for more and more wage labor. There were moves away from rural living to go and live in cities. 
in order to pursue artisanal type jobs that you might not have otherwise been able to do if you lived in the country and were therefore far away. So there are these vast migrations, people moving uh, from town uh, from the country to towns or to cities. You had people accruing more and more wealth. On average, you saw the emergence of a new class, the bourgeois, and also of a working class, and so on. So there were lots and lots of changes going on. Now, this presented an opportunity for the royalty to cash in on these changes. Royalty was like, hey, if we impose just, you know, a little tax on the people, this will reap huge benefits for us. But even a little tax for people who are extremely poor, a largely peasant population in rural France, they're going to be greatly affected by that tax. And so there was a lot of resistance to it. People very much opposed it. Now, beyond the peasant classes who couldn't actually afford this, there were people who may have been somewhat better off, or maybe not even, who were trying to pursue new ways to acquire money. Money began to occupy a more and more important role in that society. And if money is characterized in that way, or if money is bestowed with that kind of potential or that kind of value, people are going to try to circumvent, to bypass laws in order to acquire as much money as they can. So new forms of looting, of thievery, began to occur as well, which the state or the royalty had to respond to because it wasn't conducive to uh, the, the accumulation of wealth on a broader scale if the bourgeois, the emerging bourgeois class, were being ripped off constantly by people stealing from them. So there needed to be established some kind of mechanisms, some kind of safeguards against these uh, these illegal actions. Illegal, maybe not at the time, because they hadn't enshrined uh, all of these laws into, into laws yet. But in any case, it was annoying for the royalty and the bourgeois, and they had to respond to it. So these types of mechanisms or these kinds of institutions that would respond to elevating rates of criminality, these terms weren't applied. They weren't considered criminals in the way that we understand it today. But the response to these types of actions would also be applied to guarantee the accumulation of tax money from the population. Because if you erect or if you give birth to um, a new social body that is responsible for maintaining order, let's say like a police force, and we're going to get into more detail with this as we go on, then that police force can also be put into place in order to guarantee that people are paying their dues, taxes, to the royalty. If not, they will be punished. So the oppositions that emerged to this emerging state power and the royal power they weren't all the same. They looked different between each revolt. The types of things that motivated that revolt would be different. Some people would maybe were opposing the laws that were put in place that were going to limit the their opportunities to acquire money, like they were, were going to be able to steal or exploit people or whatever. And then there were going to be uh, revolts against taxation. But what remains constant, at least Foucault says, uh, and this isn't a huge detail in the course of this text or these lectures, is that what unites them is a common hatred or resistance to the effort to try to establish laws that would ultimately be uh, infringe upon the rights of these people in their eyes. So here we would see a distinction between political and common law or common or popular law. You know, the people would want things to happen one way, but the royalty would be imposing uh, the aristocracy, you know, the powerful people would be imposing other laws that protected them. So to think about this more specifically, he, he looks at the Nupier revolts in the 16th century in France. So Nupier translates into barefoot, nu being naked, and then pied being feet or bare feet. Not that it matters. Anyways, whatever. It was named after a guy who took on the name uh, Jean Nupier. His, his original name was uh, Jean Quetil, but he took on the name Jean Nupier. And he occupied a kind of uh, a really important role in these revolts against the state and against uh, royal power. And these occurred, these revolts occurred in Normandy, in France, between about 1639 and 1650. 
Now it was largely a revolt against tax collection. And in response, the state obviously freaked out. And so they sent, the state sent a, a man by the name of Chancellor Pierre Segui, who was tasked to counter the insurgency. He took on the role of opposing these revolts. So Foucault says that this opened up new tactics of counterinsurgency to oppose these revolts and new ways to demonstrate political power and authority through signage, military personnel, and politicians. So Chancellor Seguier, or Seguier would ride through the town with his little army people around him. He'd be, you know, he'd be on a horse with all of the, you know, big robes and big signs going through demonstrating that he stands in for what the state values. And if the state with time can establish that its values are synonymous with goodness, then that man, in this case, Chancellor Seguier, who represents the state, is going to be associated with goodness. And we, you know, we, we learn this from Nietzsche as well in Beyond Good and Evil when I, Nietzsche identifies that it is the aristocracy that introduces and that really enshrines a distinction between good and evil that because they've introduced this distinction, they associate themselves with good and associate everyone else, poor people, people who are deviant from that norm, associate them with being evil, which is just demonstrates the extent to which that these terms are largely constructed uh, and the way in which they are associated with some people is uh, constructed. So the chancellor traipsing through the town, demonstrating his or illustrating his power, his being good association with the king was a way for the king and the king's power to leave the king's body and be represented as a, as a kind of simulation in this chancellor. So the chancellor took on that royal position of power, sort of transferred that power to himself, or was it was transferred to him. And then when he went through the town, it was a way not to demonstrate the chancellor's power, but to demonstrate the king's power through the chancellor. Now, the revolts, although they were largely comprised of poor people, not everyone, even the rich people, liked taxes. And this certainly continues to today in lots of ways. Like the differences are, are like, of course, taxes at this time were not going to be put, you know, towards health care that would actually help people. They would just go to uh, enriching the king. But in any case, this opposition to tax was not reserved only for the poorest people. The bourgeois didn't like taxes either, because if the people were being taxed, that means they'd have less money to go and buy things that would enrich the bourgeois, that would enrich the owners of the means of production. And similarly with landowners, if people were paying taxes, they probably wouldn't be able to pay as much rent to the uh, landowners whose lands they occupied. So the bourgeois occupied a kind of interesting position because they were privileged for all intents and purposes. They were exploiting the, uh, the poorer classes themselves. But because they were able to hide the fact that their exploitation was occurring within wage labor, and they were able to say, oh, you, you aren't being exploited by us. We're paying you. So therefore, you can't be being exploited. It would only be, you know, 200 years later with Marx that come to or even before him, but identify the way in which that wage labor is its, itself exploitation. The people weren't concerned as much with that. They were a bit, but not as much. They were focused on the imposition of tax because that is just so clear. Like it's just so apparent to them that they are being screwed over because they have to dig into their own pocket and give money to someone else. Whereas with the capitalists, with the bourgeois, they were able to pay the people, pay the workers, and then get, you know, make it seem as though that they are not exploiting the workers. So the bourgeois could kind of take a step back and this was good for them because it just intensified the animosity between the people and the state or and the royalty. So they could then, you know, further hide the fact that they are contributing to exploitation as well, that they are being exploitative. But in any case, Foucault is not totally concerned with this. What he is really concerned, well, he will be, but what he's really concerned with right now is the way that the bourgeois occupied a kind of indifferent space here. They didn't really care about the revolts. They, you know, they didn't want to 
be in the way of them so they would hide you know go and live in their mansions hide in their castles get away from or wherever they lived get away from the revolts but because they weren't specifically targeted by them all the time they could you know just sit back and watch as the uh as the chaos ensued so the revolters were obviously directing their anger against agents of the state in a more specific way so they would go after tax collectors and they wouldn't go after the seigneurs the the landowners or the bourgeois now they did mess up a few rich people's homes like don't get me wrong they would if there were rich people probably in the town they would still ransack them steal from them and so on and it was in those ways as kind of a innocent bystanders that bystanders that the bourgeois were affected they weren't exactly the targets so the uh, the poor people the revolters would also attack uh, offices and tax archives as a kind of symbolic gesture against uh, their or against tax collection in general and against the royal power taking money from them in general but Foucault adds here that these attacks on like administrative offices on on tax archives was also an attack against writing and if you remember from the last series of lectures if you haven't listened to them it's fine it, it would give you some important background information but it's not totally necessary but in that Foucault identifies the ways in which writing and new forms of measurement like mathematics were introduced in Greek society you know a couple thousand years before this 16th century France and Foucault identifies the ways in which Greek society started to change with the introduction of writing. It allowed for more forms of control and maintenance uh, by cataloging people, by coding them, by making what they owned, you know, could write them down. And then what you owed to people could be written down. You would then be beholden to the very op operation of writing itself. So when these people oppose or, or attack tax archives, Foucault takes it as a symbolic gesture, a symbolic attack against writing and the logics of, um, of date keeping, of uh, record keeping that they imply, which makes it easier to take uh, taxes from the people, to take money from them. And in some cases, the revolters were successful. In Rouen, for example, uh, that year when the revolts took place, there were no taxes. They, they managed to get away with it. But lots of these people were punished. Some were even executed uh, because of their revolts, their efforts to oppose tax collection. And that puts us here into lecture two. So popular revolt emerged in response to the increased tax pressure towards poorest populations. So those were largely peasants and people living in the city. So although revolts were different, as I said before, some... Uh, city folk were, were opposed to military and militias, or they were fighting against the military and militias, whereas country folk had more mobility. They weren't immediately in proximity with the people who'd be fighting against them, whereas in a city, because everyone's real close, chances are you were going to be right up against the military. If you lived in the country, you could, you know, they wouldn't be physically close to you, so that would give you some degree of mobility, some opportunities to collect your forces, and to plan your strategy so they were united however under the same sign of the new pied the new pied revolt the barefooted the bare feet re re revolt you know just to, for no reason translating it into english so as i said before it was primarily directed against royal power against the state the bourgeois and the nobility were largely indifferent unless it came to their doorstep which wasn't their foot which wasn't the revolters focus but they didn't like taxes either. So they were, they just wanted things to unfold, uh, let the chips fall where they may. Now, even parliament at the time was opposed to taxes because all the people working in parliament belonged to the aristocracy and largely, you know, chances are many of them were landowners who were renting out their land. And so it would mean that if there were more taxes, the people who they rented their land to weren't gonna be able to pay them as much uh, in their rent. So the revolts began to die down, Foucault suggests at least, with Henry IV of France, not of England, who had restored order by the 17th century, later, late 17th century. And he did this by turning to the bourgeois and landowners for economic policy to inform his approach to uh, the economy, also by incentivizing the cooperation of parliament by giving them profit uh, 
from the sale of offices. So parliament wouldn't be opposed to taxes in the same way because they would be earning their money uh, through other means. So they could then side more with uh, royal power, with the king. Uh, Henry IV also turned to old body of seigneurial uh, agents, so like tax collectors, judges, from a previous time that were, you know, more, I guess, more traditional forms of justice, more traditional forms of royal power that were still around, but were largely tied to the aristocracy. So when we're dealing here with seigneurial agents, we're referring to a time of feudalism where people, you know, there'd be a few people who own large swaths of land and would let people live on their land and work on the land as long as those people would pay them rent in the form of, you know, paying, giving them some of the crops that they um, yielded or that yielded from the land. So they, uh, the king also used the old bodies of trained militias that were originally put in place to protect these landowners, these feudal landowners, uh, and then would be repurposed to protect the bourgeois. And then uh, finally, Henry IV regained faith in parliament uh, and, sorry, and military support as well. So all of these things coming together allowed Henry IV, or Henri IV, is that how you say it? Le quatrième? I don't know, uh, to take over or to maintain order, to regain order. Now, quick correction, because I just realized I said uh, Henry IV established order in late 17th century. It was early 17th century. So here Foucault's talking about um, like a pre-Nupier revolt. So this period of order would precede the Nupier revolt that would happen 20, 20, 30 years later. So during this time, in the early 17th century, not the late 17th century, uh, the alignment of these different forces, so the old seigneurial bodies I just mentioned, the king, the military, uh, the aristocracy, the, their alignment would crumble uh, for, for, for many different reasons. People, people's interests began to change. People were more interested in earning money than in maintaining order except for one, one institution. And Foucault suggests that the one that remained loyal was the army. The military re re retained its loyalty to the state or to royal power. So here France saw a new repressive force in this army structure with this army that remained loyal. It usurped the power of seigneurial authority, that is, uh, and so we saw bourgeois militias and par uh, parliamentary power. The army's role was to guarantee tax collection and state authority. So it stood above all these other forms of power because, you know, they had all the weapons. They were trained, they knew, they knew what they were doing, and you couldn't really mess with them. Now, Foucault suggests that this was royal justice at its peak, which, you know, there, there would have been examples of this way before this time, but Foucault suggests that this is really when royal justice uh, was was at its highest. Royal justice being royalty transformed that is in its relationship with people uh, in a very disciplinary way through the military, where the military was almost uh, exercised a ubiquitous function. They were everywhere. And if not physically present, the fear that they would instill was always present. Now, the military at this time was responsible for two things, or, or more broadly, the logics of royal justice at its peak here was responsible for two things. It had to fully replace, fully is an exaggeration, it had to overlay itself over feudal justice, the previous forms of justice that wanted to protect the aristocracy, wanted to protect the rich people who owned the land. So you know, the seigneury and, and landlords. It also sought, royal justice also sought to limit the vestiges or the remainders of this old form of feudal justice and to repackage the king's control into a new form of control, not one that emanated directly from the king, but would actually be diffused or spread out throughout the entire social body within the state, under the state's banner. And so he suggests that there was a transformation of the king's control into a state-controlled repressive system. So it wasn't 
just as though at this time what what began to change was not that the king was the bearer of all justice and determined all laws and people could then identify and say oh the sovereign the king uh determines all the rules so if i don't like anything about this we just go after the king and then that's it we're, we're you know they represent they they created all this and then we can create something new the king began to uh, disperse his power throughout the entire social body and so what would emerge was an administrative apparatus that was responsible for maintaining order and because it was spread out throughout the social body it wasn't so easy for the people to identify where this authority was coming from it wasn't as though it was just the king because suddenly the guy down the road or gal down the road is representing the state maybe works as a police officer, maybe works in an administrative office to collect taxes. So who's the bad person here? It's not really the king anymore, but, you know, it could be anyone. And so there needed to be established a more homogenous set of rules in order to normalize, to uh, maintain order among the social body. So as I said before, the bourgeois weren't fans of taxes because you know they would have to pay as well and it meant less purchasing power on the part of the peasant populations of the working classes however they did enjoy the fact that these there were these new institutions emerging that allowed for more ubiquitous control of the population like a police force we'll talk about this more as we go on but one of the benefits of a police force is that it doesn't require the kind of training the military does and it can be more ubiquitous. You can have police officers just running around, you know, in our, and we still see this to this day, uh, this desire to control populations. You know, you don't really see the military just hanging around in your daily life, I assume. Uh, you probably see police uh, around. So police could be used and repackaged, repurposed for the bourgeois in order to protect private property, to protect their accumulation of capital. So the bourgeois wanted its own repressive system comprised of the state, the courts, and the police. Because there, you really can't deny uh, the influence of capital in transforming the way in which justice was conducted. Now, there are other, so many other things going on. It's not as though it's just that. And as Foucault demonstrated in the previous lectures, uh, money has always played a part in transforming the people's relationship to themselves, to power, to justice, and even money is not the only determining factor. So many other things. But in any case, it plays a huge part here, and it can't be denied. And the bourgeois were very clever. They liked all these institutions that were emerging that could be used to maintain order, to keep the working classes docile, to put them in the state where they need to be working for, they need to work for, the bourgeois, because they have no other options. But they were clever. The bourgeois were clever in that they associated that control not with themselves. They were able to hide the fact that they benefit from this control. And they would say, oh, look, the state is exploiting you. The state is the one putting in these measures, not us. So therefore, direct your anger to the state, which is still very much something we see today. Now, I'm always, I'm always hesitant to just apply Foucault's views onto any other time because Foucault's always clear that his analyses like, are very specific. Not to say they can't be applied, but I always exercise caution. But what he's saying here is extremely relevant when we consider the opposition to taxation among certain populations, where taxation can definitely be exploitative, no doubt. But the direction of that anger towards the government is often a way in which to normalize the exploitation that people undergo at the hands of capitalists and large corporations. So they direct their anger to the state. Meanwhile, the corporations are running down the road laughing because they just um, they were able to trick the people into thinking that the problem is the state, which it can be. Like no denying that. But uh, capitalists and industry and corporations are just very clever at concealing their role in this exploitation. Now, with all these new kinds of institutions emerging, that makes the Nupier revolt that happened 20, 30 years later so much more relevant, uh, so much more meaningful, because it was an opposition to royal power. 
and to this new form of state repression, of, of a state system of repression that was becoming ubiquitous. But because this logic was becoming ubiquitous, the Nupier revolt actually took on some of the qualities of the very system it sought to oppose because it wasn't fully aware of the fact that what it wanted to oppose was the introduction of these new kinds of measures to control the people. It wasn't really about taxation. I mean, people didn't want to be paying taxes to the government, to the king. Of course, they didn't want to be doing that. But really what was going on was their opposition to these new forms of control that they weren't fully aware of. And because they weren't fully aware of it, because, you know, they didn't have access to a bunch of history books and see how things had been changing. Instead, they, um, or I should say, as a result, they actually took on some of the repressive qualities and attributes and practices of that very system. So, for example, they would administer their own kind of justice within the Nupier revolt if one of their comrades was seen as being not properly affiliated with them or demonstrating some kind of affiliation with the state, they would be prosecuted by the Nupier revolters. Maybe some of them had even, some of them had even been executed. And this is the demonstration of another kind of power, or a similar one. It mirrors this royal power, where people who are seen as stepping out of line are considered to be bad and therefore worthy of being punished. And it becomes all the easier if you have these systems in place that all the people can really... Uh, get behind to make it so that you can punish people because you will have the support to do it. So some people would break the law to oppose taxes by, you know, not paying their taxes or by stealing or something. And in the eyes of the new PA revolt, some people broke the law in the name of their own law. That is, the new PA revolt weren't opposed to the emerging logics of control and lawfulness that were being inscribed onto the social body, they wanted their own law to be the law. And in that way, it mirrored, their revolt largely mirrored uh, state power, even though many of its effects were very important in opposing power, uh, it mirrored them in many ways as well. <laughs> what? Good explanation there, David. And that puts us here into week number three. So at the time, the state's exertion of force was labeled armed justice, a term that was kind of a catch-all, and it, but it doesn't fully encapsulate the heterogeneity of this kind of force, because people would see the army and be like, okay, well, they, you know, they have guns, they have weapons, it's an armed justice that is just going to maintain order through force. But that doesn't fully capture the extent to which that this force was exerted through all of these other administrative bodies that were record keeping, keeping track of the population, where people lived, how much they owed, where they owned taxes, and so on. And all of these worked together to maintain that order. It wasn't as though it was just the military scaring people into uh, existing a certain way, into acting a certain way. All of these other institutions were conspiring, or they were in cahoots with one another in order to maintain that order. Now, one of the ways in which these, this constellation of institutions of oppression sought to order the, or sought to control the population was by dividing them. So it created a divide not only between uh, rich people and poor people, but between country folk and city folk, even though they shared many of the same grievances. They were all being exploited by the bourgeois, they were all being taxed by the government that they were going to get nothing from. And so they're like, you know, they had, for all intents and purposes, they were well aligned. But it was in the interest of the state and all of these other emerging institutions to create and intensify a divide between, exacerbate a divide between city folk and country folk, which we very much see today. Many of the grievances or many of the issues that emerge between uh, country folk and city folk, I don't know why I'm calling them that, country folk and city folk today down political lines can, I really think, be traced to these efforts in order to create superficial divides in order to better conquer the populations, to make them ripe for exploitation. Now, to finish off this chapter, Foucault gives us just, he goes into a, not a whole lot of detail, but he explains all of the uh, specific roles that emerged within these forces or within these institutions to maintain that power. 
Now, without going into detail into all of them, so there's like chancellors who would do their thing, tax collectors do their thing, tax archivists who do, do their thing, record keepers, you know, you, you get the idea. They, they each have their own role in this framework. What I want to emphasize from this chapter, though, uh, from this last bit, instead of going into detail and just essentially just reading it, is that Foucault is aware of this transformation to such an extent, or he describes it in a way, as to illustrate that these institutions began to associate themselves more and more with the good, with being good, with being generous, with being humanitarian. So power wasn't going to be exercised as a demonstration of a king or queen's ability to punish people. Instead, it was going to start to be exercised in the state's propensity and power to forgive. So it could say, you know, if you commit a crime, like, oh, we are good, we are kind, we will not inflict this harm on you, but just remember you have to pay your taxes to us. Just remember that you are indebted to us. And it's in this way that the state was able to um, appease the population on the surface. Because one of the things that Foucault identifies in Discipline and Punish was that if you are constantly executing people, like the king constantly putting people to death, you're going to have an unruly population. The people are not going to like that. They might revolt as a result. There's going to be resistance to that. But if you transform the way the power is conducted so that it is not an overt demonstration of force, but instead takes on a humanitarian character or looks like it is uh, beneficial to the people, it is gentle and kind, then therefore you're going to be able to justify its longevity. People aren't going to oppose it as directly because they won't know who to oppose. There's no execution, executioner to go after. There's no king. The person doing the taxes is your buddy who lives down the road. And so, you know, you're really, where do you direct your anger? And that puts us here into week number four. So armed justice includes a series of operations. So it includes many institutions as well. But it portends or, or it implies, it, it includes the arrival of the army to deliver uh, staggered blows to a revolt. So the army is going to not just jump down on the population at once and just stifle all resistance. It's going to do it in staggered blows and progressively get rid of that revolt's possibility or its drive and to get rid of their fighting spirit. Now, these military blows would be accompanied by civil blows, where you then have lawyers, prosecutors coming into the scene and then arresting people, police arresting people, charges being leveled against people, and so on. So there was, it was this dual-pronged effort to limit resistance. So the rioters in this case were designated as enemies, but because they were part of the state, they weren't like outside in a neighboring country, they had to be dealt with uh, by an entire fleet of disciplinary reforms and, and new measures to handle them because they weren't just going to respond to them by killing them because uh, that would be too, too obvious. There needed to be all of these new efforts that came up, uh, these new efforts to deal with these unruly citizens. And these included new relations of force, new strategies of engagement, and new manifestations of power like we saw with Chancellor Seguier, Seguier going through the town in his robes and among his military personnel, standing in for the state's authority. But meanwhile, because power was never always like localized to the king, there would still be like mayors, leaders of small communities. And so local officials, Foucault identifies, would take this opportunity to appeal to the king to guarantee their good fortune. So local officials in a town where there were revolts, local officials would go to the king and be like, hey, I'm on your side. I'm going to try to uh, really limit these revolts in, you know, so that maybe they could get a promotion. Maybe they could get a better position in the government, in the royalty later on. But the king wouldn't, you know, the state wouldn't be thrilled about this because they'd say like, well, you let this happen in the first place. How good of a leader are you really? And so they, <laughs> the state just wouldn't respond to them in the ways that they expected. So the king would just not be comfortable with such alliances because he's begun to internalize a firm distinction between good and evil. He is good, 
And the rioters, and the people who allowed the rioters to emerge, the local officials, are evil. And so he aligns himself and the state that he has diffused his body throughout or spread his body throughout, his, his power throughout, is good. Everything else that opposes that is bad. And so royal power views itself as standing for equity, which is, might seem strange, but it views the population as a homogenous mass. And only those who are evil and therefore worthy of punishment will be punished. So there isn't discrimination based on class, based on religion, based on uh, gender, anything like that, at least ostensibly. <laughs> of course, like they would still discriminate on these, on these uh, bases as well. But the idea was that they would treat the population as a neutral, homogenous whole, and only those people who are evil would be punished. And that puts us here into the last uh, lecture we'll cover, lecture number five, uh, before closing off here. And so he identifies that in 1640, so right as the new PA revolt took place. And it was at this time, you know, right when the revolt, revolt took place, that civil power would enter Rouen to exercise its uh, civil, civil power, its authority. So it did this by... Uh, having the army be under the control of Chancellor Seguier, who is, you know, traipsing around with his horse and robes and stuff. And this administered justice somewhat arbitrarily. He would punish according to no established order, but whoever the chancellor saw as being, you know, bad, he would order their being punished. But not, like, didn't want to do this overtly because then he would be the sign of power. So the chancellor's power was indicative of a desire to distribute authority throughout the social body. So this also demonstrated in 1640 that the king was not necessary for the king to exert the king's power. A new administrative body takes over the king's body. So the visible body of the state replaces the king's absent body. The king can then disappear into the shadows. And these people secure taxation and would come to replace the old authorities, like people in parliament, the seigneurial authorities, feudal feudalism, feudal systems, and so on. So the mayor's powers would be replaced with state representatives. Chancellor would come in and say, like, your job is done. You've done enough as a bad local official. We are going to take over here. And this was quite alien because, you know, you, you also have to understand that these people, these communities were largely separated. But chances are they all spoke different languages even. Uh, like, their dialects would just be, be so radically different. But... In any case, the state would come in, the state would come in and then reduce all of these differences to a model that it could control. And so people would begin to homogenize and, you know, take on certain similar qualities that allowed for states to emerge so that people would share values. But in lots of cases, these values emerged uh, as a result of state authority of the imposition of laws that forced people to become the same. Whereas, you know, people would have different values in different communities from town to town. They would speak different languages, have different ways of life and so on. And this isn't the only thing like new forms of communication emerged. Uh, people could travel easier with roads and railroads and so on. Telegraph, other types of later uh, and so on allowed people to homogenize. But in any case, it is through these repressive, oh, this is one way, uh, through these repressive mechanisms that people began to take on uh, national characteristics and associate with one another. So the military would disarm the population as well, take away their weapons because then they could be more easily controlled. At least took weapons away from the poorest people. They would let richer privileged people keep their weapons, uh, the bourgeois to keep their weapons to protect their property while taking weapons away from some people. So all happened to disenfranchise the poor and to elevate the power of creditors, people who were lending out money uh, in order to, you know, and they do this by keeping their guns and defending themselves, or they'd hire militias to defend them. And yeah, that'll close off what we'll cover today. Next week, we'll start from lecture six, go all the way up to 13, and then that'll cover this. I hope I was clear. If there's anything I got wrong, anything I excluded, anything I wasn't clear about, let me know. Uh, and let me know what you think is relevant about this for today. I mean, I always wrestle with these ideas because, as I mentioned earlier, they seem totally relevant. 
but I'm also very hesitant to just apply them willy-nilly to any other social situation many centuries later. In any case, tell me what you think. And if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.